All right, let's take a look at some criticisms of the cosmological argument. We have some selections from David Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion. So Hume was an 18th century Scottish, Scottish philosopher, and he wrote this series of dialogues between three characters, Demia, Cleanthes, and Philo. And in the, the main drift of the dialogues tends to be skeptical. Typically, Demia or uh, Cleanthes will present some argument for the existence of God. And then the character Philo, whom we can pretty well identify with Hume, will refute all these arguments in one way or another. So Hume was a skeptic. He was a skeptic about lots of our common metaphysical ideas, not just the concept of God, but lots of other basic metaphysical concepts. Uh, he was a skeptic about the power of human reason generally. He was a skeptic about many of our claims to knowledge. He did not believe that we have the knowledge that we take ourselves to have. So that is basically the skeptical position. And I'll uh, touch on a few particular examples as we go forward. But for the moment, suffice it to say that we have a, sh a short passage from the dialogue in which Demia has been arguing for and, and is arguing for the cosmological, uh, I should say is arguing for the existence of God, and, and the arguments are versions of the cosmological argument, which we've talk, talk, talked about, touched on in connection with Aquinas and Samuel Clark, we've looked at a few different versions of the cosmological argument. We've seen that in a couple of versions of the cosmological argument, we saw this both in Aquinas and in Clark, a lot rests on the idea that God is a necessary being, because here again, everything in the physical universe is contingent, and it seems like a natural inference, perhaps, perhaps not. We've spent a good bit of time on this point now. Maybe this is a good inference, maybe not. But it has seemed a natural inference to many people that therefore the universe itself must be contingent. And therefore, there must be a necessary being to explain why there is the contingent universe, the contingent physical reality that we find ourselves in the succession of contingent things here again has to have some ground, has to have some explanation, and the previous contingent thing can't be the explanation. So there must be a necessary being. And then we saw, especially in Clark, the idea that when it comes to a necessary being, there's a kind of contradiction involved in denying its existence. So we've seen that that was an element in Clark's argument for the existence of God. There must be a necessary being as the ground of the order of contingent beings. And to deny the existence of a necessary being involves a kind of contradiction. There's no contradiction in denying the existence of a contingent thing, because contingent things, as we've said, come into existence and go out of existence. But a necessary being, a being that could not have not existed, is an eternal being. And once you understand that existence is an essential property of this being in a way that is not true of any contingent thing. Any contingent thing has existence only for a time. So we might say it's not an essential property. A contingent thing comes into existence and goes out of existence. But in the case of God, the concept is the concept of a being that has existence as a necessary attribute or a necessary property. Therefore, there's a kind of contradiction involved in denying its existence. So we've seen that that was an element, especially in Clark's version of the cosmological argument. Well, in our passage from the dialogues concerning natural religion, uh, one of the characters makes the point that, or at least asserts, that there is no being whose non-existence implies a contradiction. So we see one of the characters make this basically this same point a number of ways. Anything that you can conceive of as, ex as existing 
Hume says, you can just as easily conceive of as not existing. There is no being whose non-existence implies a contradiction. Hume himself doesn't say that. Here again, uh, one of the characters in the dialogue says that. But here again, for our purposes, I'm going to, when it comes to these skeptical arguments, these arguments that refute these different versions of the cosmological argument that Demia has presented, I'm just going to identify the criticisms with with Hume, since that tends to be the drift of the of the dialogues. The the drift, the thrust of the dialogues tends to be skeptical, and we know from Hume's other writings that he was skeptical. That he was a skeptic, and so for our purposes, I'm going to simply identify Hume with a certain point of view in the dialogues. Although strictly speaking, the skeptical views are put across by characters in the dialogues. So just call. Let me just call your attention to that point. There is no being whose non-existence implies a contradiction. And Hume goes on to say, nothing that is distinctly conceivable implies a contradiction. So if I can conceive of a state of affairs, then there's no contradiction in that state of affairs. Well, that seems like a natural inference. Many, many people have thought so. Many, many philosophers have taken that view. But when you think critically about it, as many philosophers have, it's not so clear that that's right. Just because you can conceive of a state of affairs it isn't really clear that no contradiction in the state of affairs is involved. Or perhaps the fact that you can conceive of it shows that there's no contradiction in that state of affairs. But there seems to be a further move that Hume is making in the course of the arguments. He goes from the proposition that nothing is that is conceivable implies a contradiction to saying that therefore it's possible. If I can distinctly conceive of a state of affairs, then it's a possible then it's a possible state of affairs. He seems to go that step further in the course of the argument. And this would be the claim that conceivability entails possibility. And this is an old idea in philosophy, the idea that, look, if I can conceive of a state of affairs, again, distinctly, it has to be what Descartes would call a clear and distinct conception. You have to be able to clearly and distinctly conceive of the state of affairs. Of course, you can just put words together and say, oh, yes, I'm conceiving of this, but not everything not everything is conceivable, right? Just because you can put the words together, it doesn't really follow that there's any clear conception in your mind. So take take the example of a round square. Suppose I were to say, suppose someone were to say, I'm conceiving of a round square. Well, if someone said that, I would I would be reluctant to believe that there's anything any, any clear and distinct conception going on in that person's mind because I know such a entity is not possible. So, of course, you can say it, but that doesn't really show maybe in some sense you're conceiving it just to, as a certain combination of words, but that doesn't really show that you're conceiving it in this distinct way. So nothing that is distinctly conceivable, this, this adjective here is important. If you can clear, it's an old idea in philosophy that if you can clearly and distinctly conceive of a state of affairs, then, then that is a possible state of affairs. At least God could bring it about. An omnipotent being, an all-powerful being, could bring it about. This is an old line of reasoning in metaphysics. Descartes, uh, as we'll see later, relies on this line of reasoning uh, in his Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes turned to him in the next unit of the course. Uh, it's an old idea in philosophy, but it has been subjected to criticism, and it's perhaps not the case that conceivability entails possibility. Just because you can conceive of a state of affairs, it doesn't necessarily follow that it actually is possible. So maybe there's no contradiction in it, but the next step that therefore it's, it's a possible state of affairs, it's, it's not so clear that that's a good inference. And it seems like, it seems like that is the claim on which Hume is relying. 
because on page 525 of Bonjour and Baker, in our selections from the dialogues, the, the, the argument continues here uh, a little bit further. <clears throat> and he's talking about the fact that I can conceive of any particle of matter being annihilated, and then he therefore goes on to say it's not impossible, which amounts to saying that it's possible. So that's why I say that although Hume only actually explicitly says nothing that is distinctly conceivable implies a contradiction, in this passage he seems to take the next step and say that if something is distinctly conceivable, then it's possible. Let's just read through the passage uh, quickly. This is on page 525 in the second column. Cleanthes say, We dare not affirm that we know all the qualities of matter, and for aught we can determine, it may contain some qualities which, were they known, would make its non-existence appear as great a contradiction as that twice two is five. I find only one argument employed to prove that the material world is not the necessarily existent being. And this argument is derived from the contingency both of matter and the form of the world. Any particle of matter, it said, may be conceived to be annihilated, and any form may be conceived to be altered. Such an annihilation or alteration, therefore, is not impossible. And what Hume goes on to argue there is that if you can conceive of the non-existence of the material world, then you can just as easily conceive of the non-existence of God. Okay, that's the thrust of Hume's skeptical argument in this passage. But in making that argument, he's relying on a controversial premise, namely the premise that conceivability entails possibility, just because you can conceive of a state of affairs, therefore it's a possible state of affairs. That may not be true. Many, many uh, philosophers have subjected that premise to criticism. As I mentioned a moment ago, it plays a, an important role in Descartes' argumentation in the Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, work that we'll be looking at in the next unit of the course, but already in Descartes' own time, one of his contemporaries, uh, the French philosopher Arnaud, said that's not true and gave uh, an exa gave a counterexample. He gave an example of a state of affairs that's conceivable but actually is not possible. So this counterexample to the premise that conceivability entails possibility has since come to be known as Arnaud's triangle. Arnaud is talking about right triangles, they all have this property that's identified by the Pythagorean theorem, which says that the hypotenuse, uh, the square of the hypotenuse uh, is equal to the square, the square, the sum of the squares of the other two sides, right? So the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, where c, of course, is the side that is opposite the right angle in, in the right triangle. So that's a property that holds true of every right triangle. This was a discovery of Pythagoras. And Arnaud makes the point that people had, this was a discovery by Pythagoras. People had geometers, people in general, who studied geometry had a conception of right triangles before Pythagoras made his discovery. So people understood had a clear and distinct concept of a right triangle, understood what a right triangle was for a long time before Pythagoras discovered that they have this property, such that, here again, a squared plus b squared is always equal to c squared. That's true of every right triangle, but for a long time that wasn't known. So Pythagoras discovered that that is a necessary property of every right triangle. A right triangle cannot not have that property, cannot fail to have that property. But people were clearly and distinctly conceiving of right triangles before that was known. So people were clearly and distinctly conceiving of right triangles as if they did not have that property. So such a geometrical entity was conceivable, but actually it's not possible. Pythagoras discovered that it's not possible. Every right triangle must have that property. Or to say the same thing a different way, here again, no right triangle can fail to have that property. But before Pythagoras made the discovery that right triangles have that property, here again, people already had a clear and distinct conception of right triangles. So that seems to be a counterexample to the thesis that 
conceivability entails possibility. Just because I can conceive of a state of affairs doesn't necessarily follow that it's therefore possible. That was Arnaud's point. Uh, another example from the contemporary literature on this uh, issue, conceivability and possibility, uh, has come to be called in the literature the amnesia counterexample. Suppose someone comes to have amnesia and doesn't know, as in the kind of classic amnesia scenario, doesn't, doesn't know who he is, doesn't know who she is. So amnesiac doesn't know who she is, and she's wandering around trying to figure out who she is and uh, maybe finds, finds a notebook, say, for example, that has her name on it and starts reading uh, about the person, starts reading the notebook, with the, and, and is reading about the person whom she assumes is not herself because she's an, an amnesiac. She doesn't know who she is, and she just happens upon this notebook or maybe uh, happening upon the notebook and finding the name, Googles the name, and starts reading about the person. Well, that whole time that amnesiac is reading about herself, she is clearly and distinctly conceiving the possibility that that's some other person, but actually that's not possible. It's not possible because that actually is herself. So the amnesia counterexample is another proposed counterexample to the thesis that conceivability entails possibility. The critic of that premise would claim just because we can clearly and distinctly conceive of a state of affairs, it doesn't follow that it's possible. So Hume's argument, uh, his skeptical argument against the cosmological argument here is on what is arguably a shaky foundation. Just uh, one question that we should raise about it. Another line of argument uh, against the cosmological argument that we find in Hume's dialogues has to do with the nature of causation. We see one of the characters saying, look, there's no more difficulty in supposing that the universe has always existed than there is in supposing that there is an eternal being distinct from the universe a necessary being who has always existed. There's no, more, there's no more difficulty in conceiving of the material universe itself as always having existed. There's no, difficult, there's no difficulty in the one conception that, that, that isn't already present in the other conception. So the universe, so I, I, in so many words, the character says, I, I don't accept the cosmological argument because it posits the necessity of a being distinct from the universe that is eternal as a, a kind of inference that we must make from the fact that everything in the universe is contingent. But there's no contradiction in so here again supposing that the universe itself has always existed. There's no, con there's no difficulty in conceiving of that that isn't just as much present in conceiving of a being distinct from the universe that is eternal. So the universe itself might just as well be eternal. So I don't accept I don't accept the argument for that reason. And then if the universe itself is eternal, then it makes no sense to speak of a cause of the universe because there was no time antecedent to the existence of the universe. If the universe is eternal, which is just as possible from a logical point of view, the character is arguing, then no question arises of what is the cause of it because the, there is no previous event to the existence of the universe because the universe has no beginning. So that would be one skeptical argument uh, against the cosmological argument for God's existence. The character asks, how can anything that exists from eternity, and, and here now the, uh, the character has changed the terms of debate to arguing that the universe itself might well be something eternal. And if that's the case, then how can anything that exists from eternity have a cause? Since that relation, namely the cause-effect relation, is what he means here, that relation implies a priority in time. 
Okay, so that is one of the lines of the skeptical uh, argumentation in the dialogues concerning natural religion. We have a number of ways in which skeptical refutations of the cosmological argument are attempted, mainly by the character Philo, although the character, uh, the character Cleanthes also puts forward some refutations or attempted refutations of the cosmological argument. So if the universe itself is eternal, then the idea of a cause makes no more sense than the idea of an antecedent cause bringing God into existence. There's no difficulty in, in conceiving the one state of affairs any more or any less than the other, Hume argues. How can anything that exists from eternity have a cause, since that relation impri implies a priority in time? But if the universe is eternal, then there is no priority in time. There was no time prior to the existence of the universe. So there's a picture of Hume, 18th century Scotch philosopher. He certainly was a dandy, wasn't he? Look at that getup. Nice threads, huh? Maybe I should come to class dressed like that one of these days. He was a skeptic about, as I said a moment ago, lots of our basic metaphysical ideas, not just the concept of God, but, but lots of common sense metaphysical ideas. He was a skeptic about causation, say, for example. This basic metaphysical idea that we have of a connection between events. Here again, as I said earlier, Hume does not believe that we have the knowledge that we think we have. That is just what is meant by any skeptical view, any skeptical position would be the position that the knowledge that we take ourselves to have, when you really analyze it, we don't actually have. And Hume was a skeptic about pretty much everything, pretty much all of our meta basic metaphysical notions, such as that, for example, one event in the world is connected to another. He was a, he was a skeptic that we have any actual knowledge of cause and effect. We, we take ourselves to have such knowledge, of course, but Hume denies that we do. He's a skeptic. He says that our knowledge of cause and effect relations is, in fact, just knowledge of constant conjunctions or of regular succession. So this might at first glance appear to be a little bit of a tangent that I'm going on, but my point here is that he is going to reject any kind of argument for the existence of God according to which God is the cause of the universe because he doesn't accept that we have any knowledge of causation in the first place. He's a skeptic about our knowledge claims, our claims to know that one event was the cause of another, or our claims to know that one effect, uh, one event, excuse me, was the effect of some other event, its cause. He denies that we know that. We talk that way all the time, but he argues that when you really introspect the content of our experience, what you will find is that you can't find any evidence for such a connection, such a causal connection. Hume was a uh, skeptic about our concept of causation here again. We take ourselves to know that there are connections between events. Uh, our knowledge of cause and effect is one of our basic metaphysical notions. Hume was an empiricist. Uh, empiricism is a broad kind of epistemological thesis. It's the thesis about knowledge that all knowledge comes from experience. All knowledge derives from experience. So here again, this would be a broad kind of position in epistemology. The empiricist position would be one approach in epistemology, this branch of philosophy that here again deals with knowledge. And Hume argued that when you critically analyze the content of experience, what you find is that even though we have this metaphysical notion in us of a connection between events, when you critically analyze the content of our experience, what you find is that there actually isn't any such experience. And because there isn't any such experience, we're really just projecting onto the world a confused, mistaken notion when we think that one event is connected to another. We're really just projecting onto the world the pattern that is familiar to us. We're really just projecting onto the world the pattern of our experiences.
So certain kinds of events are always conjoined. Here again in our experience, here again human is an empiricist, all knowledge comes from experience. And in our experience, certain kinds of events are always conjoined. There's a kind of constant conjunction or regular succession. So take the example of one billiard ball striking another. Hume gives this example. When, let's say, billiard ball A strikes billiard ball B at time 2, let's say at time 1, billiard ball B is at rest, billiard ball A is in motion, and then at time two, there's a collision, A strikes B. And then at time three, B undergoes a change from being at rest to being in motion. Let's call the event at time two, when A struck B, let's call that event one, and let's call the event at time three, when B underwent a change from being at rest to being in motion. Let's call that event three. We take ourselves to know I'm sorry, let's, at time three, let's call that event two. We take ourselves to know that event one was the cause of event two. Okay, that would be an example of a cause-effect connection. This is one of our basic metaphysical notions, the notion of a connection between events, or what is sometimes called a causal connection. Hume argued when you critically analyze the content of experience there, we don't actually experience the connection. What do you actually experience there? You experience that the one object comes into contact with the other, so what Hume calls contiguity. We actually experience contiguity, and you notice that the one thing happens after the other, that is to say, after billiard ball B is struck, it undergoes a change from being at rest to being in motion. <clears throat> so that's what Hume calls succession, but that's all that we experience. When you critically analyze the content of experience, that's what you, what you will find is that that's all that we actually experience, just contiguity and succession. We never actually experience the connection between the events. So he was a skeptic that we have knowledge of such connections. What we do, he thinks, is that we just project onto the world the patterns that are familiar to us. So when you watch one billiard ball collide with another, that's, that's the way it always unfolds. That's the way it always happens. And so because that's the pattern of our experience, we mistakenly project onto the world that there's some kind of connection between the events. But here again, this mysterious metaphysical notion, Hume finds, is not actually grounded in experience. So the premise that all of our knowledge derives from experience, which many people have found a, a plausible premise, many philosophers, many just people in general, on hearing that would say, yeah, that seems that seems right, that seems plausible. It is arguably the case that that premise, certainly in Hume's employment of that premise, it leads to skepticism. It leads one to conclude when you critically analyze the content of experience that actually we don't have a lot of the knowledge that we take ourselves to have. So it actually leads one to skepticism in, in many respects, or at least it's arguably the case that it does. Okay, so Hume was just a skeptic about causation in general. We don't even have any knowledge of cause-effect connections. So, of course, he's, if he's a skeptic about causation in general, then any argument to the effect that we must infer the existence of God because there has to be some cause of the universe and the universe can't be the cause of itself, obviously a skeptic like Hume is not going to find that argument persuasive because he doesn't even believe that we have knowledge of causation in the first place. So this kind of skepticism about causation would be, this kind of Humean skepticism, this kind of Humean skepticism about causation would be one consideration or set of considerations that philosophers have had for, for being skeptical of the cosmological argument. All right, so I've presented a couple of lines of thought in Hume's skeptical Refu refutations of the cosmological argument, or at least uh, attempted refutations. I don't want to beg the question one way or the other as to whether the skeptical arguments achieve their purpose. Um, you'll have to decide what to think about that for yourself. Just 
presenting both sides of the issue. Now that I've presented Hume's skeptical arguments, I'll raise some critical considerations uh, about them in turn. Hume seems to be relying on a very narrow concept of causation. He's assuming that all causation is temporal, right? That it, we saw that his argument against the cosmological argument was that, or at least one of the arguments as we've seen, is that the universe itself could just as easily be eternal. There's no more difficulty in conceiving of that state of affairs than there would be conceiving a being distinct from the universe that is eternal. And if the universe itself is eternal, then th there's no sense to be made of the issue of a cause because there is no priority in time to an eternal thing. If the universe is eternal, then there was no time prior to the universe. Therefore, there's no need to infer a cause. But that's assuming that all causation is temporal. But is all causation temporal? Uh, Hume's criticism here seems to assume that it must be. But we've seen that there's an older classical conception of causation that is somewhat broader than we really get across when we use the modern English word cause. The modern English word cause does tend to have those connotations of some previous event some previous moment in time, or some event at some antecedent moment in time that then brings about another event or another state of affairs at, at some later time. So yes, the modern English word cause, cause does kind of have that temporal connotation to it, but there is, as we've seen before, this older conception of causation rooted in Aristotle's metaphysics that is somewhat broader. So we might say that the efficient cause of something is typically something that exists prior to what it brings about. So in the case of efficient causation, yeah, the efficient cause is, tem is, is prior in time. Efficient causation, we might say, is temporal. So what were some examples of efficient causation that we talked about? Well, the efficient cause is always the maker of what is made. So a sculptor is the efficient cause of a sculpture. So, of course, it's true. The sculptor does exist before the sculpture. Uh, in the natural world around us, we see lots of examples of efficient causation. When a bird builds a nest, here again, the bird exists before the nest does. So, yeah, efficient causation is temporal. When a beaver builds a dam, the beaver exists before the dam does. So, yeah, efficient causation is temporal. But we saw that in the Aristotelian fourfold analysis of causation, an efficient cause is only one kind of cause. We saw that there was also, in Aristotle's way of thinking about explanation or causal explanation, there's also the material cause. Take, for example, this question. Why is the statue so heavy? For Aristotle, it would be helpful maybe for me to add here, anything that answers a why question is in some sense a cause. Why is the statue so heavy? Okay. When it comes to answering that question, of course, the answer doesn't have to do with the efficient cause. It doesn't have to do with the sculptor. It would have to do with the material cause. And a perfectly good answer to that question might be because it's made of bronze. Now, that's a perfectly good answer to the question, why is the statue so heavy? Because it's made of bronze. Maybe you're moving statues around in a museum, and they're the exact same dimensions, exact same size and shape, uh, but then you find one is much heavier than the others. And you, and you ask somebody, why is this one so much heavier? And, and you find out, well, the others are made of wood, but this one is made of bronze. Okay, well, that would explain why the one is heavier than the other. But, of course... The bronze is still existing at the same time that the statue exists. So it's not as if the bronze is making the statue heavy at some time earlier than the statue's existence, right? So in the case of a material cause, right, the cause isn't some earlier event. Or we also saw that Aristotle had the notion of a formal cause, sometime the, sometimes the form of a, of a thing explains certain facts about it. But the form of the thing still exists as the thing itself exists, right? So in geometry, say, for example, the form of something might explain certain facts about it. 
Here again, a cause for Aristotle is anything that answers a why question. Take, for example, a why question in geometry. Why is this angle a right angle? Well, one way of proving that an angle is a right angle in geometry, one way that you could give a proof would be to demonstrate that it's equal to half of two right angles. If it's equal to the half of two right angles, then it's a right angle. That would be a perfectly good proof in Euclidean geometry, right? So we might answer that why question, why is this angle a right angle, by saying because it's, it is equal to the half of two right angles. But here again, that's an explanation that appeals to the form of the thing. It appeals to certain facts about the form of a right angle. It's a fact about the form of a right angle that it will always be equal to half of two right angles. That's the truth of geometry. Well, that fact about right angles has to do with the form of right angles, but that fact about a right angle is simultaneous with the state of affairs that it explains. That's a perfectly good explanation of why a right angle is, a, is why an angle is a right angle. But that fact about it is still existing while the right angle is itself existing. So it's not as if the formal cause is some temporal cause, right? It's not something that's true of the angle at some earlier time. So it's by no means clear that all causation is temporal. We also saw that Aristotle had the notion of a final cause or a goal, right? And sometimes the final cause or the goal explains something. And that's definitely not a case of causation in the sense of some earlier event causing some later event, right? Say, for example, your neighbor starts walking in the evening. He didn't used to. Now you notice that your neighbor goes out for a walk every evening. You might ask someone, why does he walk every night now? And you come to find out that the doctor told him that for his health, he had better start, he had better start walking every night. Okay, well, what is the explanation for his walking? The goal. What was the goal? His health. Well, apparently his health doesn't exist yet. He was in bad shape, and the doctor said, you better start, you better start walking. Well, he's walking for the sake of something that doesn't exist yet. So you definitely can't say that the goal, namely the health that doesn't exist yet, he's walking in order to bring about the health. You can't say that the goal was some earlier event that, that explains why your neighbor is walking. So that would be another example here. In that case, that would be what Aristotle called a final cause. But that's definitely not a case of some earlier event being the cause of some later event. So formal cause, material cause, final cause. They wouldn't, involve, they wouldn't involve causation in, in this narrow sense on which Hume is relying, namely this idea of some earlier event that causes some later event. So Hume is relying on a concept of causation that is necessarily temporal, but we've seen that there is this older classical conception. At least some of the time, an explanation is simultaneous with the state of affairs that it explains. It's not some earlier event. Now, I suppose you could say it's true, however, that that would not be the case with respect to God as, as conceived of by Aquinas and Clark, because they are conceiving of God as some entity that existed before the universe and in a creative act brought about the universe. But that's just, of course, one conception of God. That is the Judeo-Christian concept of God for which Aquinas and Samuel Clark would be arguing. But there is an older Aristotelian conception of God, a uh, concept of God that goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle believed that the universe was eternal. Univer Aristotle did believe that the universe had always existed. But he also believed that God was the cause of the universe. So he did not conceive of God as some entity that created the universe at a time. He believed that the universe is eternal, but he also believed that all of the contingent things in the universe have to have as their ground some necessary being. It was just that for Aristotle, the necessary being was eternal as well. They were both eternal. But the one thing explains the other. Why is there this universe of contingent things? 
no, no particular contingent thing in the universe can be the explanation. Therefore, Aristotle also thought it a natural, even though Aristotle believed that the universe had no beginning in time, has always existed, Aristotle did also believe that God was in some sense the cause of the universe, not in the sense of an efficient cause, but in the sense of a final cause. Aristotle believed that God was concurrent with, and at the same time, the goal of the universe. All things in the universe strive to be like the, strive to be like the divine being God. So, ad admittedly, that's um, a, a different conception of God from the one that is more characteristic of modern philosophy. But I think it's worth pointing out that even if one were to restrict causation to causation in, in the temporal sense, that would only be a fair criticism of God conceived one way, not necessarily the only way in the history of Western philosophy. And it's a question, would God's power, causal power, require temporal priority? Here again, I've just given examples of Aristotle's other causes that don't involve temporal priority, don't involve some earlier time. There are other kinds of explanatory priority, formal priority or explanatory priority or logical priority. I'm going to, for our purposes at the moment, use those three just pretty much interchangeably. Uh, here again, the basic form of a thing explains many facts about it and the basic form of the thing may not explain all of the particular facts about it that distinguish it from other particular things, but the basic fact about it explains more about it than the details of the particular kind of thing that it is. So what would be an example? Every quadrilateral has certain properties in virtue of being a quadrilateral and being in virtue of being a four-sided object. So there's a kind of formal priority to a rhombus, say, for example. The fact that it's a quadrilateral has priority, has formal priority, to its being a certain kind of quadrilateral. So a rhombus and a rectangle and a square <clears throat> and a parallelogram, these are all different shapes that would fall under that broad heading, quadrilateral, four-sided object. The fact that a rhombus is a quadrilateral explains more facts about it than the particular kind of quadrilateral that it is. So that would be a kind of formal priority. Now here again, it's a rhombus and a quadrilateral at the same time. Both of those facts are true of it at the same time. It's not as if one fact exists earlier than the other, but one thing does explain more. The fact that it's a rhombus <clears throat> explains the particular kind, certain facts about the particular kind of quadrilateral that it is, but that it is a quadrilateral is, is prior. Something can be a quadrilateral without being a rhombus but nothing can be a rhombus without being a quadrilateral. So the one fact explains more than the other. It has a kind of formal priority. Logical priority, by logical priority, here again, I would mean pretty much the same idea. The fact that something is a mammal explains many properties of it beyond the particular kind of mammal that it is. So the fact that X is a mammal explains more than the fact that it's a raccoon. The fact that it's a raccoon, say for example, will explain many specific properties about it that distinguish it from other kinds of mammals. But the fact that it's a mammal explains a wider range of properties uh, about it. Now here again, it's a mammal and a raccoon at the same time. It's not as if it's a mammal at some earlier time than it was a raccoon, but there's a kind of logical priority the more basic logical type, the more basic category, natural category, to which it belongs has certain logical consequences, namely that it has such and such properties. 
something can be here again, a mammal without being a raccoon, but something cannot be a raccoon without being a mammal. Therefore, the one fact about the thing has a logical priority over the other. Uh, roughly the same idea is sometimes put in terms of explanatory priority. And here again, explanatory priority would not be a kind of temporal priority. It wouldn't be a kind of earlier event in time that explains some later event. So the wetness of water, say for example, the fact that water has the property of being wet, is explained by its molecular structure, is explained by the fact that it's composed of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Now, water is H2O, and water is wet. Both of, those, both, both of those facts are true of any parcel of water at the same time. But the one fact explains the other. The, the wetness of water doesn't explain why it has the molecular structure that it does. It's the other way around. The molecular structure explains why water is wet and why it has, why it has such, uh, other kinds of properties as well. People had a concept of water for a long, long time before it was discovered that water is H2O. It was a discovery that the properties that it has at the macro level are explained by its microphysical structure. But here again, its structure below the level that we can perceive. But that was a discovery. Once that was discovered, though, a state of affairs that is simultaneous with the properties of water, such as being wet, here again, it's Water is H2O while it is also wet. Both of those facts are, of it are true at the same time. But the one thing explains the other. The wetness of water doesn't explain why it has some molecular structure that it is. The direction of explanation is the other way. So there are all kinds of priority besides temporal priority. And so even if one were to concede Hume's narrow conception of causation, The skeptical arguments based on that conception would only apply to God conceived of uh, in, in one way. So I wouldn't say that it would be a decisive argument against the existence of God. Hume goes on to argue that the notion of a whole, the notion that the universe is an entity distinct from all of the particular physical parts that make it up, is really a fiction. It's really just an act of the imagination. So this is another of the skeptical arguments that is uh, presented in our s selections from the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. Does the whole require an explanation? Does there have to be an explanation for the universe in any case? Hume is skeptical, clearly, that there, ha that there has to be any such explanation because he's skeptical that there is any such thing as the universe conceived of as something distinct from something more than just the particles that make up the physical parts or the physical particles that make up physical reality. Here again in the second lecture we talked about Occam's razor, right? The simplicity criterion. It's an old idea in philosophy that the simpler explanation is more likely to be correct. And so it's an old idea in metaphysics that it's a virtue of a metaphysical theory if it be relatively simple. And it would be a relatively simple metaphysical theory. It would be a metaphys metaphysical theory that would do well by the simplicity criterion if we said there's only one kind of thing that exists, basically just the basic particles of the the basic physical parts, the basic particles of the physical universe, that's all that exists. That would certainly be a simple theory, wouldn't it? That would be a metaphysical theory that would do well by Occam's razor, by the parsimony principle. Posit as few explanatory entities as are necessary to explain the phenomena. That's the idea behind Occam's razor, as we've seen, right? Well, uh, a theory, a metaphysical theory that would do well by that measure, by that standard, would be what we might call atomism, a theory according to which all that exists are just the basic physical parts of the universe, the basic physical particles. Anything besides that 
that exists, uh, such as the familiar objects of our daily experience, trees or dogs, acorns, pickles, chihuahuas, to mention a specific kind of dog, aardvarks, are really just so many different conglomerations, are really just so many different aggregations of the basic physical thing in the universe, namely just the basic physical particles, the basic physical parts. So humans are skeptical that, there is, that the whole, that holes really are even real. They really only exist in the imagination. They don't really, holes don't really exist outside of the mind. There's no, in a sense, there's really no such thing as the universe. There just is the set of physical particles. And it, Everything that needs to be explained about the physical, about the universe conceived of as a whole is already explained by the aggregate of simple parts. So this would be another kind of skepticism. Hume is a skeptic about our notions that things that we conceive of as wholes even really exist in any, in any robust sense. They only exist in the derivative sense that they are just different combinations of basic physical particles. Or at least that's the metaphysical view that seems to be in play when we read this particular skeptical argument that Hume is presenting. So with respect to any argument that we've seen, and we've seen versions of the cosmological argument work in this way, everything in the universe is contingent. Therefore, it can't be the explanation for the whole universe. No contingent thing, no particular thing in the universe can itself be the explanation for why there is the whole succession of contingent things, the whole universe itself. Therefore, we, we must infer some entity distinct from the universe that is its cause. Well, here again, as I said with respect to causation, Hume doesn't even believe in holes. They don't really exist outside of the mind. In the imagination we can take, in the mind, we can take different combinations of physical things and interpret them as different holes. That just goes to show, Hume would argue, that holes don't really exist outside of minds. All that really exists are the basic physical parts, the basic physical particles. So what would be an example? Well, looking at a pack of cards, I, I, I could interpret that as 52 cards, and I could say the whole is 52 cards. But the 52, is the 52 cards really a thing as distinct from the basic physical parts that make it up? I could just as easily interpret the same whole as 26, 26 red cards and 26 black cards. That would be a different interpretation of the whole. Is that a whole too? Or I could just as easily interpret the same entity as four suits. Okay, is that the same whole, or is that a different whole? Four suits, 26 cards and 26 black cards, 52, 52 cards. The very same thing I can, I can conceive of as different holes, which Hume would argue just goes to show that holes don't really exist outside of the mind. Here again, the same pack of cards. I could conceive it as so many millions of basic physical particles, right? I could conceive it as so many millions of protons and electrons as well, right? For any entity, I could conceive of it as any number of different holes. That just goes to show that holes don't really exist outside of the mind. All that really exists are the basic physical particles of the universe. So that would be a certain metaphysical view. So if Hume is skeptical that there are even are holes, then he's not going to be, then of course he's going to be skeptical of any argument for the existence of God that requires that we infer the existence of a God to explain why there is the whole universe. Does the whole require an explanation? Does the notion of such an explanation even make sense? Hume thinks not. He argues, the whole, you say, wants a cause. I answer that the uniting of these parts into a whole, like the uniting of several distinct counties into one kingdom, is performed merely by an arbitrary arbitrary act of the mind. Did I show you the particular causes of each individual in a collection of 20 particles of matter? I should think it very unreasonable should you after, afterwards ask me, should you afterwards ask me what was the cause of the whole 20? This is sufficiently explained in explaining the cause of the parts. So holes 
don't really exist outside of the mind. The whole is such only by hypothesis. So let's think about this example that he gives of several distinct counties united into one kingdom. What is his point there? Well, when we think of the boundaries of a political entity, right, we know that that political entity, those boundaries aren't really in the fabric of reality, right? Think of the counties that compose the state of South Carolina, say, for example. It's not as if it's a basic metaphysical fact. It's not as if it's a basic fact about reality, right, that South Carolina had to be identical to the set of counties that it now is, right? Maybe when the boundary between North Carolina and South Carolina was being drawn, it could have just as easily gone the other way. Maybe Marlboro County ended up being a part of North Carolina instead. And then the boundary of South Carolina would have just looked a little bit different, right? By hypothesis, that is to say, as a kind of act of the imagination, as a kind of declaration, we say, okay, X, you know, this set of counties is now going to be the state of South Carolina. But it's not as if that's a basic metaphysical fact. It's not as if it's not as if that's somehow woven into the fabric of reality. It's not as if we're somehow discovering some basic metaphysical truth, right? That was just a convention. It, the convention could have been, could have ended up being something else. So in a sense, here again, the whole doesn't exist outside of that mind or the minds that intend to conceive of a certain number of regions as constituting one state. If there were no human beings to recognize the legal conventions by which we stipulate that X number of regions compose the state of South Carolina, then in some sense there would be no South Carolina. Of course, there would still be the physical places, even if human beings disappeared. But there wouldn't be the political entity that we think of as South Carolina, would there? The whole is a kind of fiction. It doesn't exist outside of minds. It's not somehow in the fabric of reality. And Hume is saying the same thing about this notion of the whole universe. All that exists are just the basic physical parts. The universe itself, conceived of as a whole, distinct from and demanding an explanation, that doesn't really exist. The whole doesn't really need a cause. It would be sufficient to explain how every particular particle came into existence. And perhaps Hume has in mind here some metaphysical view according to which science can perfectly well explain the origin of every particular particle of matter. And once that's explained, well, then everything is explained. The whole, you say, wants a cause. I answer that these uniting, that the uniting of these parts into a whole, like the uniting of several distinct counties into one kingdom, is performed merely by an arbitrary act of the mind. Did I show you the particular causes of each individual in a collection of 20 particles of matter? I should think it very unreasonable should you afterwards ask me, what was the cause of the whole 20? This is sufficiently explained in explaining the cause of the parts. So let's just make sure that we understand that point. Suppose you're looking at a collection of 20 marbles, let's say. And you ask someone, how did that come to exist? How did this collection of 20 marbles come to exist? And then your interlocutor tells you, well, marble A was brought into existence in such and such way. Marble B was brought into existence in such and such way. It ends up giving you the explanation of each of the 20 marbles. Okay, so now at that point, you have the explanation for each of the particular marbles. Hume is saying here, it would be very unreasonable then to ask, okay, but now give me the explanation for this collection of 20 marbles, right? Your interlocutor could very well say, I already have given you the explanation. I've explained every part. Once every part is explained, it's unreasonable to ask for some other, it's, to, it's unreasonable to think that there's some other explanation for the collection, right? A collection doesn't exist outside of the mind. You could conceive of the same 20 marbles as part of a larger collection, or you could conceive of some subset of those 20 as, as themselves being a collection, right? A collection, a whole doesn't exist outside of a mind. So this is another uh, of Hume's uh, skeptical arguments uh, against the 
skeptical refutations or attempted refutations of the cosmological argument. It's a mistaken inference, Hume is saying, to think that there must be an explanation for the whole universe. There isn't even the whole universe. The whole doesn't exist outside of minds. The whole is only such by hypothesis.